Hello, 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 everyone, and welcome to CosPod and Beyond. We are proud to have this CosPod dedicated to DS9's birthday. This is DS9 month. DS9 aired January 3rd, 1993, and every January we take time to celebrate what is our favorite um, Star Trek incarnation. So we have myself here, Darlena, and my partner is Ms. Perry. And we are proud to have Sally Seagraze, our wonderful, wonderful guest. She is our Kira cosplayer here to celebrate DS9 with us. And we decided that we love Kira. Okay, and years ago, we did something a long time ago called the 10 best kick butt fight scenes for Kira Norris. And we showed 10 clips of like Kira really throwing down. So we decided for this month, we're going to center on five of her amazing speeches. Just, you know, the way she just expresses herself and just lays it on the line. No matter who wants to hear it, she's, you're going to hear it, okay? Because that's how Kira is. So we have picked five really great scenes. And I'm sure all of you who have seen these Space Nine episodes quite a few times like ourselves um, will definitely... Um, remember these scenes. So again, my name is Darlena and uh, I'm a cosplayer and we have this great YouTube channel that we started and we look forward to having all kind of wonderful cosplayers come on and share their love of fandom with us. And um, my partner here, Ms. Perry, tell us a little bit about yourself. I am a cosplayer. I'm also a seamstress and um, our wonderful cospod. I am so happy to be a part of because we get to explore the fandom we get to express ourselves and we get to bring on our counterparts and, you know, all the other people who love all types of fantasy, fiction, sci-fi. It doesn't even matter. You're, you're part of the family. Awesome. Awesome. And our special guest. I met this young lady in Vegas. Oh, my God. Like, what, five years ago, 10 years ago? I don't remember. I've lost, <laughs> I've lost track. I've lost I know. And she is just one of my favorite, favorite, favorite cosplayers. What I love about her is that, you know, she keeps it simple. When she talks about how she designs her cosplays, it's, it's simple. It's you make She makes you feel like anybody can do it and anybody can do it because all you have to do is just be patient and be creative and you don't need a lot. And she's really good at sharing how to take just everyday stuff and make it into a cosplay. So our wonderful guest, Sally, tell us a little bit more about yourself, sweetie. Well, thank you. I think you just about covered it, Darlena. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I do believe anyone can cosplay, honestly. I try to base as much of my work as I can on secondhand clothing to show that you don't need a huge budget or really any sewing skill. You can just slap things together. And as long as you're having fun, you're going to look great at the end. So your love for the character is what's going to show through. I always try yes. and reinforce that. Yes, I agree. I agree. So we all have a special thing in our heart for Kira. And I'm going to start off and then the, my other two uh, buddies here will chime in on why they have a special respect for Kira and how the character of Kira Norris, how that character really you know, touched our heart and, and talked to us, um, especially throughout her development on D Space Nine, which was most excellent how they developed that character. Um, I was also inspired to do this cause by uh, some friends of mine who have a podcast. They actually had a wonderful voice only interview with um, the Nod Visitor. So if you get a chance, mm -hmm. a few channels over as a sci fi sisters, check out, check out their. Um, mm -hmm. um, voice only interview with Nana and uh, they also go into you know her career and, 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 and her character and everything. So when I first saw the Kira Norris character, I, I just loved her strength. I loved her being this champion warrior fighting for freedom for her people. And, um, you know, I just really respected that. I saw her as like, you know, a Bajoran Rosa Parks and, you know, all those uh, black women who um, stood up for freedom and everything like that and fought through the civil rights and fought oppression. And so I definitely related to her uh, that way. Um, when DS9 went off and then September 2011 happened, 2001, sorry, when that happened, um, I joined the military three weeks after that. And so the role of Kira now took upon a greater meaning to me as myself being someone involved in the military and, you know, wanting to defend my city against oppression and everything like that. And just 
her character, you know, it had a deeper meaning to me. And I really, really related to it more from the military woman warrior angle now, um, being in the military. And I had the honor of sharing um, a lot of the episodes with Kara with my fellow women soldiers. And uh, I made a lot of DS9 fans <laughs> throughout that because the whole, <laughs> the whole thing with Kira and then the Dominion War, you know, it just, it just parallel to so much of what we were dealing with with 9-11, those of us in the military. So I showed a lot of episodes in the morale, welfare, and recreation room. And um, a lot of people just really, really, my sisters enjoyed Kira and Dax. They didn't know Star Trek like got that deep and had such strong woman characters. So um, I was honored to share that with them. So that's why she's special to me. And if I ever get a, a chance to meet Nana, I will share that with her. Um, Ms. Perry, you have something you'd like to say about Nana? Yeah, um, when Kira? I first was introduced to that character, I thought she was so arrogant and insubordinate and just rude. And the way she talked to my captain, I just wanted to choke her. And over time, <laughs> I came to see how passionate and strong and in command they made that character. And she was just so authentic to me. Mm -hmm. You know, and then just watching that whole journey for her um, and her growth. And even though she's you know, an adult, there's a maturity that happened from the beginning <clears throat> to where you know she ended up. And especially, you know, that wonderful love that they shared as well on screen. I and that's why that character stays in my mind, you know, so so much depth to that character. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, definitely, definitely. Thank you for that. Sally. Yeah, I, I imagine it would have been different to see her on screen for the first time as the show aired in the 90s because I didn't get into the fandom until like 2015. And by then, there were other female characters that were that well written, but I still think Kira really was in a class of her own at the time. Um, yeah, the way that she talks to Cisco at first, I think probably shocked a lot of people. But she wasn't a Starfleet character, and that was something new at the time. She was kind of allowed to go out of bounds and to say whatever was yes. on her mind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So true. So, and then she, you know, she was going through a lot um, and she wasn't so sure if having, you know, the Federation come in so quickly after Bejo just, you know, got their freedom. I mean, I could definitely understand that because yeah. sometimes, you know, when you fought one outside, you know, group of people um, and you're finally free, to make your own decisions and your own destiny to have another group of people come in and even though their intentions are good you know i can still see one would be concerned about well you know maybe we haven't had enough time as a people to get back on our feet before we start you know interacting and partnering with another group of people even though we know all about the federation and their good intentions still so i kind of like understood you know her anger and everything um <laughs> And I, I, I did see in terms of like, you know, the military protocol, yes, it was a lot of insubordination, but, you know, it was good that, um, that's what I love about um, Captain Cisco, because he, you know, he came in a difficult, a difficult environment, you know, that environment with Bajor, and then they had the inner problems, and then the issues with the Cardassians, and then the Federation have to do this delicate balance, and then he had to do this delicate balance between the Bajoranis and the Federation mission. So he didn't have an easy role either, and dealing with her was not easy. <laughs> but but again, over time, like the way her character developed, the way she started to flow, their relationship, you know, with him being an emissary and everything just was just beautiful i just and that's one of the things i love about deep space nine is all the characters start off one way and then they gradually develop into something even more powerful and wonderful so um i was very happy with the way they dealt with her character i had no complaints um the way the writers wrote her the way her speeches came through the way she started to change and see differently, you know, the relationship between Bajo and the Federation. And then of course her eventual romance with, uh, you know, with, with Odo there. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I am, um, I'm definitely, definitely have to say that that is one, uh, one major woman character um, in all of fandom that I definitely relate to and respect and, um, and 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 empowered by you know even sometimes like now when i feel like you know i'm being overwhelmed and 
whatever. I just I put on a Deep Space Nine episode and I see Kira being strong and everything and telling people like it is and telling people where to go and what to do when they get there. I, you know, it just it strengthens me and it encourages me definitely. Okay, so anyone else have anything else they'd like to to share before we start showing the videos, video clips? So like I said, um, <laughs> so like like I said earlier, what we're gonna do is we're gonna show the video clip and then we'll, everyone will just kind of chime in about you know how they feel about it. Okay, so let's start with our first video clip. Again, this is five kick butt Kira speeches. Enjoy and uh, let's get started. Here's the first one. This is from the Emissary Part 1, Season 1, Episode 1. Kira standing for a home. This is where heroes are made. Right here. In the wilderness. This wilderness is my home. Yeah. You can make yourself useful by bringing your Federation medicine to the natives. Oh, you'll find them a friendly, simple folk. That's right. <laughs> and look on his face. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so Sally, you want to share with us your impressions? <laughs> oh yeah. I think I think this is, if I remember correctly, the first time we see her like interact with someone in Starfleet that's not her superior officer. So she really has the freedom to say exactly what she's thinking. And I think this kind of mindset maybe has been building in the Trek universe for some time. We just haven't had a chance to see it. You know, that the Federation thinks they're so far above everyone and that they come to these inferior worlds. And to kind of see that Mm -hmm. at face value instead of glorified in the previous shows is really yes. something. Yes, yes, I, I agree. I yeah. agree with that. Miss mm -hmm. Perry? I, I agree with exactly what she said. And it's like the way he kind of got caught out there, you know, as they do on their high horse. And she knocked him down a couple pegs. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Somebody had to do How dare you? How dare yes. you? Yeah, again, this goes back to, um, like I said, you know, her being a situation where she just, you know, did all this fighting all these years for the freedom of her people. And yes, everything is just kind of like, you know, discombobulated. And then you have this Starfleet officer. He has privilege. He's had privilege all his life. And to him, he's looking at this as an adventure so he can show forth his greatness and, and a challenge. Um where he can shine and everything. He's more looking at it from him, you know, his personal intake and everything, um, instead of looking at it from her eyes. And so she just kind of had to remind him. And this is so, uh, you know, this is so like life, you know. Um, it's like, what would have been the best way to handle this, you know? Now, if I was a Starfleet officer, a medical Ooh. officer, and I'm coming into this situation where we got to help this poor homeworld get themselves together, Instead of coming from like, you know, this whole arrogant about, oh, I can do great things here and I'm going to shine brightly. Like he should have just kind of said, OK, you know, tell me, what would you like to see Starfleet do in terms of being able to administer good medical care to your people? You know, what are some of the medical issues that have been affecting Bajorans both here on the space station and on Bajor? You know, come with that kind of humble type of, you know, uh, um, you know yeah, you know, interaction. And I think he would have got a different response than what, he, <laughs> than, you know, than what he got. But this is life. You know, even on my job, we have people that they're new and they're energetic and they feel they're going to change everything and they know everything and you can't tell them stuff, you know. And then, you know, those of us who've been there for a while, we have to kind of take them down the pick or two, you know. <laughs> but, but this shows the development of, you know, uh, the doctor's relationship, and that's what we'll see in the next episode. Eventually, he becomes a little bit more aware of his situation, and then who he is, and then his reaction um, with with Kira. Okay, so let's let's go to the next speech. This is season three, episode nine from the Defiant. That was a great episode. Please listen to me. You can't have 
have a runabout. You cannot get your medical supplies, and I don't give a damn about the colonization schedule. Those colonists can make do with a box of bandages for all I care. Stop right there, Major. When was your last day off? I don't know. What does that have to do with anything? If you can't remember, then it's been too long. You're off duty as of this moment. What do you mean I'm off duty? <laughs> no, I love that last scene. <laughs> what do you mean I'm off duty? And you know, the way she just does that thing with the head is... <laughs> It's so cool. It's so cool. So I love this scene because what I like about it is, unlike in the first scene, we see the doctor kind of like come into his own and um, come into his own authority, you know, and and have a better way of dealing with, with Kira, you know. So he understands that she's stressed, but, you know, he understands also that he's the doctor and it's his job to care for everyone on the station. So stress, as we all know, can cause you to say and do things. <laughs> that's not that's not too cool. And it's not good for you. So, and, and a lot of people didn't realize, but that is an actual military thing. In the military, a doctor can relieve you off duty, even the commanding officer. And there's nothing <laughs> anyone can do to override that. <clears throat> but what I like, uh, again, about her character is that, you know, they, they're not making her out to be perfect. And that's what I love. She's stressed. She's overworked. She goes from warrior to second in command of one of the most expensive, you know, well, you know, not money expensive, but most important um, pieces of real estate in the sector um, for, for Federation and for Bajor. And so now she has this whole new role that she has to play. Um, and then she has all these, you know, reports and everything that she has to do. And she's just stressed. Okay. So, I mean, we all lose it sometime, you know. So when I see this episode, I, I, you know, I don't feel bad whenever I get stressed and I kind of like lose it. You know, I don't feel bad, you know, because it's like if you stress, you stress. And this teaches us all that when you feel that kind of stress, you need to, you know, pipe it down and, 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 and take a little vacation and, 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 and relax yourself. Because I'm all for, you know, we had an episode where we talked about Nadell and Finna, and we went on about the importance for women to um, take time for themselves, no matter how busy they are and everything, how important it is for us as women, no matter what our multiple tasks we have to juggle, take time to, you know, take care of yourself and do some self-care. So any other pressures with this particular clip? Well, definitely, I, I read into that box of bandages because it was clear that <laughs> she's been bandaging up things for a while and um, just kind of, as people do in those leadership positions, you don't mm -hmm. have time to ponder, take, you know, breaks a lot. Mm -hmm. She's dealing with a lot. So she just mm -hmm. putting a patch on it, putting a patch on it, and boom, you know, now mm -hmm. it's like a gushing wound. You need a vacation. <laughs> and it's like... <laughs> Yeah, that's good. I never saw that one. That's very yeah. good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's something yeah, definitely a lot of people who, um, of course, are Kira fans um, mm -hmm. experience. And it's a great lesson to learn. Like, you know what? Hmm, have I been bandaging up a lot lately? Let me watch some more DS9. Relax. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. Oh, that's okay. very good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sally? Um, for me, well, Julian's my favorite character, so this is, like, the start of him learning how to treat his patients. Like, he wouldn't give such a brash order to anyone but Kira, I don't think, because that's what she needs to listen, is to just be ordered off duty. But at the same time, like, she hasn't, I mean, she was an officer in the militia, but she wasn't really working in, like, a, in a professional role. So for her to be ordered off duty isn't something she's ever considered. Like, who would order her off duty when she was constantly at war? Right. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, definitely a shock to her, but that's exactly what she needed in that moment. Wow, that's true. That's true. I never looked at that either. See, that's why it's so wonderful when you watch these episodes and you you, know, you talk about it with people. It's like you get to see something different, something new, something more in depth um, than what you took away from it when you saw it the last four, five, six times. You know? yeah. <laughs> so that <laughs> that is so true. Like you know, uh, like Anna, what you said about putting bandages on things. You put a bandage on it, but 
you know, it, it doesn't necessarily give way to healing. Sometimes along with bandaging, you just need to stop and rest. You know, we injure ourselves physically, you know, we may take medicines and, and, and put a bandage on it, but sometimes the body just needs to stop and rest, you know? And, and then as Sally said, um, looking at it from a point of view where you're used to operating one way and then you're in a situation where, you know, you're in this structured environment and what may have been okay in the past is not okay now. And so you have to learn how to, uh, to like I said, juggle the differences mm -hmm. and, and accept as she wants someone to accept her authority, she must also accept other people's authority, like the authority to be ordered off duty, which have never happened to her. <laughs> Yeah. And from someone that she just told off not that many episodes ago, so, mm -hmm. <laughs> so that that was a really that was a really interesting moment there for Kira. Mm -hmm. Okay, here's our next clip, season seven, episode twenty-two, tacking into the wind, and this is when she's helping out the Cardassians. Kira, you won't be satisfied until every one of us is dead. Oh, I don't have time for <laughs> that. here if you if you didn't see this episode i'm pretty sure everyone did but in this episode as you um remember uh the federation is helping their cardassians um to try to overthrow the dominion and so kira you know, puts on the gray and black i love her in the gray and black mm -hmm. and uh she being someone who is familiar with what it takes to get rid of the oppressor she's now helping the cardassians which is a strange thing but as you can see with this guy here he um he doesn't trust her. He thinks that she's just trying to come up with ways to further uh, do harm to the Cardassian people, and you know then he makes the mistake of putting her <laughs> hands on her. So when I see this, I I love how you know she puts him in his place, um, both physically and verbally, um, because sometimes you know as women we are in situations where you know people want to play us cheap and play us weak. And we have to just kind of stand strong. So these are this is one of those clips where um, I know when I was in the military, um, especially when I got to the point where I was in charge of my squad, you know, I, I had a couple of guys that was kind of like, you know, this woman ain't gonna take no orders from her. And, you know, and it was like kind of bucking up my up, up against my authority. And, and so, you know, had to have some moments i didn't i didn't have to lay hands on them but um one of them i did elbow because he just got in my face and uh, <laughs> and the other one i just wrote him up on disciplinary charges but <laughs> as, as a woman in the military you sometimes have to take some you know you have to deal with some crap you know so when i see mm -hmm. this particular scene like this really really ministered to me um as someone in, in a woman in the military being in charge of my own squad. So, but again, this is what I love about this character. Um, no nonsense, doesn't take any crap, is not going to be, you know, pushed around, it's not going to be played for a fool, and um, just a, a real source of inspiration to, to young women coming up in the world with all they have to deal with to remain strong and to remain steadfast. And to you know, stay a lady, but stand up for yourself. So that's my takeaway impression from this. Mm -hmm. Me, I I was always the smallest person in the room in the class <laughs> growing up, and you know you're the smallest one in the group too. I'm, oh, everywhere I go, you know, I'm you know mis misjudged for weakness, mm -hmm. age, just just being small. And as a kid, I was always fighting. I was mm. always getting into fights and I was always winning. <laughs> Sorry, my cat's in a row. We love kitties. Yes, I have my kitty here by my school. And that really like inspired me because I saw her the same way um, on DS9. She's the smallest little firecracker. Mm -hmm. And that was always me. I, I'm not usually quiet, but if you bothered me, if you picked with me, you better be ready. And then, yes. yeah, that's what they got. That's what the Kardashians got. Loved it. Loved it. <laughs> <laughs> Sally? 
that's is this is the start of that amazing end arc or just an incredible episode on its own but mm -hmm. i need to go back now seeing that again and like count the amount of times that kira tells someone flat out take your hands off me because she does it i think three or four times throughout the series and that's yeah. that's great for a character to stand mm -hmm. with boundaries like that i don't think we see that a lot and uh just that the Cardassian doesn't believe that she's trying to help. Mm -hmm. When I think a few seasons ago, maybe she wouldn't have been helping. So it really shows mm. her growth as a character toward the end. Yes, Th this is true. Yes, there was another scene. Um, I think it was with Cork. He yeah. put he put his hand on her waist, and she said, "If you don't take that hand off my waist, you'll never be able to lift a glass with it again." Mm -hmm. And I and love that's this early because too, I think. It, yeah, that was early, early yeah. on. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I, I love this with, um, and I don't think we we've seen this kind of um, character and this this kind of environment uh, of women um, saying something about a, a man putting their hands on them. Um, I know with the Me Too movement and everything like that, you see more women coming out. Um, express themselves about things that may have been okay or you know wasn't considered a big thing you know now we take a, a different look at it I know like on my job when I started on my job um, you know I would see certain things I would hear certain things and everything and then it's like as the women's movement started um, zeroing in on certain inappropriate you know inappropriate um, behavior and activities that were that weren't made a deal of before my job would put out all of this um, memos on what's considered appropriate inappropriate they was offering classes and everything those sensitivity classes and everything like that and just you know i i would i would hear women say about you know men that they work with put, putting their hand on their back their shoulder the this the that you know telling them you know sexual jokes and everything and you know, and it wasn't like, it wasn't an issue. The environment was like, it's no big deal. So, you know, just kind of deal with it. But then, you know, as time passed, we we see where in the work environment, and, and, and this has now um, gone throughout all environments of life, all aspects of life, um, no matter where you work, whether it's your social network, whether it's your religious organization, wherever you are as a woman, there are boundaries that you can establish. There are boundaries that you establish you don't have to talk and you just set those boundaries and say hey this is the way it is we're not we're not going to have this we're not going to tolerate this this is inappropriate and this is what i love about this scene and all those type of scenes where you know she lets it be known this is not appropriate um the scene with cork yeah you know you can look at it and say it was just cork being cute but is it appropriate he wants to flirt, but she's not trying to hear it, okay? And then this scene here, again, just the, the belief that you can just put your hands on the woman, you know, um, I love how in DS9 with, with Kira and Dax, we, we see these women characters not tolerating certain things. And I think that's a real source of encouragement, definitely, um, to, to young women and to, to women coming up in the world. Okay, so let's go to the next scene. This is Darkness and Light, one of my favorite episodes. Season 5, episode 11. This is when she was kidnapped. Um, Three others were crippled. Don't you feel guilty? Don't you feel ashamed of what you did? None of you belonged on Bajor. It wasn't your world. For 50 years, you raped our planet, and you killed our people. You lived on our land, and you took the food out of our mouths, and I don't care whether you held a phaser in your hand, or you ironed shirts for a living. You were all guilty, and you were all legitimate targets. So this scene right here is really powerful. When I saw this scene, I totally was just, oh my God, I jumped off the couch, and I just started screaming, and I started clapping <laughs> fingers and I, I, I high five my cousin because she was watching with me and uh it was i remember it was my cousin and my mom we were watching together and we we high fived each other because we really we really rooted her on in this scene um we felt that you know she what she had to say was legitimate um 
from her perspective uh, as a and another thing with the word terrorism like terror we say we know she's a terrorist that's what they call it whether or not she would be called that after post you know post 2001 who knows but um prior to 9-11 um for Kira, the word terrorist uh, was something that, you know, we respected because of who she was. She was fighting for freedom for her people. So the Cardassians consider her a terrorist. Most most others, including myself, would consider her more a freedom fighter. So I guess it depends on how you look at it. She would be a terrorist to the oppressor and a freedom fighter to those um, to her people and those who are ruling her on. But in, in war, it's like, you know... You can have protocols or you're not going to have certain protocols. So here she says you all were legitimate targets. This Cardassian, you know, he wasn't anybody involved in the military, um, but his face was disfigured because of a bomb that she set. Um, so his whole point is, you know, you just kill randomly. You don't like pick specific people. You just take it all out on all the people. And Kira's point of view is like, well, hey, you know, if your people weren't there to begin with, then your face would be okay by now, you know? So it's like, you know, her point of view is, look, I'm fighting for the freedom of my people, so you're all legitimate targets. And it kind of makes us think, you know, when when a people sits back and allows their government to treat another group of people a certain way, you know, it's kind of like you're aiding and abetting. So from Kira's perspective, that's the reason why she felt, um, you know, all Cardassians were suitable targets. Even this poor guy here who <laughs> didn't do anything but, you know, I think it was a foul clerk or something or whatever he was doing. So I, I think this scene and this whole episode was pretty, you know, pretty in intense because he was this revengeful, angry, upset Cardassian that started picking off you know, the specific Bajorans who were involved in the terrorist attack where he was injured. So he's saying that he's different than her and even better than her because he went after specific Bajorans instead of like just Bajorans. Whereas when she was fighting, she went after all Cardassians. It didn't matter. And so he feels he's like morally superior uh, to her. So this was, this, this episode right here got a lot of conversation. How do you guys feel about it? And we'll start with very, you. very um, emotional, this um, particular piece gets me because I see it from so many different points of view and the way, um, you know, that was scripted, the way it carries, it's like, I can put different faces on her and him, different mm -hmm. cultures, different races, you know, different groups. And it's just like, you know, it's a commonality that everyone has felt, not just shared and you see it. And like now you see it from, you know, this perspective and just like you were saying, Darlena, each group think they're right, you know, they're in the right. And it's just, it's just so sad that, you know, even now we still have this dynamic going on where we can't reach, you know, a consensus. We can't find a way to get past and build, you know, from what was and the way just like Kira brought it through got me really like you know a little emotional when I saw that mm -hmm. because the first first thing I thought was about my culture because you know that's for African Americans is we're still dealing with that and the way you explained it as well you can <clears throat> see where I'm saying you can put any heads on the two and see how that argument plays across like mm -hmm. for everyone I just love how in general with Star Trek, they put things out there that will take us, you know, into the depths of our soul mm -hmm. and really make us question, you know, the reality we're living in. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm saying. That's true. Now, you said that you can see different, you can see different angles from this particular scene in this episode. Um, what are some of the angles that you see? Like I, I, what you mentioned um, was one, and is there another uh, perspective that you see that you take away from this episode yes. from this thing? Yes, and also going back to piggybacking off of what you were saying about the definition of terrorist, because mm -hmm. you know cultures, other countries may see Americans as terrorists, even though we're coming to help. Like we were covering earlier, we're another faction coming in when 
the other group is now trying to rebuild. <clears throat> Even though we're helping, we're still seen as an authority, you know, impeding on their culture and traditions. Mm -hmm. Whether it be, you know, <clears throat> Arabic and American, you know, um, <clears throat> there's a lot of different other races and cultures that are still kind of at odds, you know, mm -hmm. for things that great grandfathers have done. Right. And the rebuilding process has not been able to really, you know, happen on both sides to a point where connections are being drawn, which we got in DS9 toward, you know, the middle and the end, especially when she started to really understand and stopped saying all Cardassians, you know, mm -hmm. she started to meet and understand and have those conversations I think like you were mentioning the um the file clerk how that one ended which is so unfortunate yes. but <clears throat> yeah that's I'm, I'm so, I was so happy like when things changed in her character that way and it wasn't it was showing that people can change you know you know exactly. once you really paint that picture that even as you know a viewer you can see clearly each part thinks they're right this is the reason why but you know, because this is fantasy, that you know what the real dynamic is, what the real issues are. But you don't see it in real life because you're living it. Right. You have to kind of bring yourself out and see it as a third party. Mm -hmm. And she definitely did that, mm -hmm. and she grew. And that, that's why she's one of my favorite characters. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Thank you for that, Sally. Yeah. I wish I could dive this deep into it, but um, I haven't. I haven't lived that experience really. But the way I see it is, this episode illustrates for us that even if you're standing by silently, you're still on the role of the oppressor, which mm -hmm. this Cardassian guy doesn't really realize. Even though he didn't actively take a role, he was on the planet and therefore complicit in the planet being occupied. I like that complicit exactly, mm -hmm. and that was her point to him. Um, mm -hmm. which, you know, he wasn't accepting, but, you know, like we're saying, different people will see different, um, different perspectives based on their viewpoints and what they value. So, um, she valued her planet and, um, anybody who, you know, doesn't matter if you're involved in the military or not. That's one of the things I love about this country because, no matter who's in charge, president or not, the people have the should have the ultimate right to say, the, you know, decisions made by the government, if it's not righteous, if it's, if it's harming other people, we have the right to say something about it, okay? So if the Cardassians did nothing when their military and their government decided to occupy and control Bajor, and they had no protests about it, they... You know, they didn't, uh, you know, as far as they were concerned, they went about their lives and they're mad about all the poor Bajorans being killed. Then they not understand Kira's perspective, okay? And like you said, you're being complacent, so you must agree. And if you don't agree, then when no one says anything, then it makes it seem like you all agree. So now I'm sure there were, as we saw later on, like with the gentleman who took upon the face of the file clerk, um, pretending to be, and that was a great episode. I mean, that was like a play or something, yeah. that whole back and forth dialogue between them, you know, yeah. it was just, oh my God, you know, antagonist and protagonist was amazing. Um, so there were Cardassians that felt bad about what was going on, but I'm quite certain it probably was a type of environment where, if they dare to speak against it, they probably would have been executed or deemed a traitor or something like that, right? So, um, probably, yeah. yeah, so unfortunately, that's, that's the dirtiness of war. This last scene is sort of a culmination of all the other scenes and everything we've been talking about with the change in Kira and her coming to a realization of who she is, where she came from, and how everything that she was involved in shaped her and affected her and how she became concerned about that not only for the sake of her own inner peace but for how people looked at her and interacted with her so this next scene is really powerful and i really love it <laughs> this is kitty so cute. yeah season one episode 12 battle lines i don't enjoy fighting yes i've 
I fought my entire life, but for a good cause, for our freedom, our independence. And it was, it was brutal and ugly and... That's over for me now. That's that's not who I am. I, I, I don't want you to think that I am this violent person without a soul, without a conscience. That that, that is not who I am. So this scene right here is just really, really amazing. Um, what I love about it, again, is... is so revealing you know she's just revealing herself and coming to terms and this this scene and her having that revelational moment with kyle parker as you remember this is a scene where kyle parker doesn't die like she died and then she came back alive because they were on this planet where nobody died so this scene right here um is where i see where she stops she stops being you know just angry and she accepts that she's been angry and she's been this angry person. And, you know, she now sees that she feels others may be looking at her as just this angry person and you're just angry all the time. And this is another form of, of post-traumatic stress when you've been involved in, in war and everything and you have, you know, this, this you know, harshness, you have uh, anger inside of you and uh, you're trying to navigate through it, but it still comes out from time to time and affects people around you. So she's having this revelational moment with Kyle Parker, where she's trying to um, like, you know, unveil, unveil how she feels and, and, and she doesn't want the Kai or anyone to think that she's just angry person and she enjoyed killing um, and because she, you know, did it so well. And, uh, and I love the Kai's response to her because it just, um, it, it, it helps her to, to, to really come into awareness of who she is and that, and who she's not. And she may think she's someone, but she's not that person. Other people may think she's a certain type of way, but she's not. And this was early on in the uh, series. And I think it set the stage for the continued self-awareness journey that the character took. And as she navigates through that, she gets to a point where, as you said, um, and she starts to see Cardassians different. She starts to see the Federation different. She starts to see her relationship with the emissary different. And, and then uh, the relationship with everyone around her differently. And it culminates into towards the end of DS9, she's this self-assured, at peace, confident um, leader that's able to step up when Cisco's not there. Um, she's able to care for the needs of the space station and the Bajoran people. And she just is just this well-rounded person. And uh, I, that's what I love about this scene because it just sets the stage for her to become who she is in the end. Sally, how, yeah, how do you feel about it? Yeah, please. Yeah. Um the fact this is such an early episode is kind of surprising, but you're right. It sets the stage because it's like a mini finish of how she's going to end up. And then we get mm -hmm. to see it play out in real time as the series goes on. I yeah. love that she confides in her spiritual leader um, yeah. because we know that that's going to turn into an important part of her character. And I think it's, it's nice for them to show that on what otherwise has been kind of devoid of religion on Star Trek. Um, oh, even if we don't get a, a huge glimpse into the details you know it's mm -hmm. it's nice that she wants to be seen well by her by her spiritual leader yes that's that's the, I'm glad that was you excellent that. point that's really good. yeah was a real big part of why i love these lines so much because they were leading into that and mm -hmm. yeah like you were saying they put it in a way where you know it didn't cause a controversy mm -hmm. but it, it was still highlighting you know, the commonalities, which is between, you know, about all religions and, you know, really making people understand how much spirituality affects you on a day to day basis, what, no matter where you are in life, even if, you know, you are in command, if, if anything, that's, you know, guiding you the most because it's mm -hmm. the reasons why you're getting up 
to do what you're doing. You know, it gives you inspiration when you feel like hope is lost. And I love that she showed that vulnerability at that point. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there are a lot of people who see you in a way that is not your true self. And maybe you haven't, be, you know, gotten the chance to be your true self, which she got to be as, you know, the series carried on. Things kind of, you know, de-stressed for her. Less bandages, more vacation. <laughs> little time to party. <laughs> you know, she got to enjoy herself. Hanging out at the bar later, you know, going, you know, enjoying some of those virtual moments. In the holiday she with Dax, up, right? Right. <laughs> and really get loose. <laughs> with the with the massages and, and, and Dax yeah. said, haven't you, know, have you pretended? You, and she was like, I never pretended. No, I, I pretended I was killing the Cardassians and we were free of them. <laughs> and then poor Dax is like, okay, that's not what I meant. <laughs> <laughs> So you're right. You're right. That's true. Less bandages and more actual healing and, and being vulnerable like that. That, that was a good point. And that's just, you know, that's why I just love this character. It's I, She's one of the most fascinating, complex characters um, that I've known in all of the Star Trek series. According to me, I just, you know, even like the current characters, they have great complexity going on and mystery. But I, I think Kira, they really did a good job developing that character. You know, the writers, the way they wrote, you know, that's one of the things I love about the conventions. Like, I love the right, everyone comes out to see the actors, but you know, we gotta give, we gotta give a hand to the writers because the writers, you know, they write these, these, these lines and these amazing actor and actresses bring them to life. And it's just so powerful. Now, what I also love about Nana Visitor um, is that she has on IG, if you, if you are on Instagram, she has an IG there. And she has this thing that she does called um, uh, it, Mama Nana, I think the it Mama is. Nana yeah. yeah, Mama Nana. Yeah. <laughs> and um, she she does these daily uh, words of encouragement and affirmation. And she reads a lot of books. And um, so when she reads something that uh, she thinks is really great to share with people to help, just help them with life, you know, help them with guidance, help them with feeling good about themselves and navigating any issues they may have and being at peace with themselves and not putting a whole lot of pressure on themselves to be perfect. So um, I know at the cruise, she she did a panel when I was on a cruise in um, 20, 2020. Um, she did a, a panel called uh, Ask Mama Nana and, uh, and the whole audience, it, she didn't want to go into, you know, her role on Star Trek. She just wanted to talk to people. She wanted people to just ask her questions about Hey, you know, I'm going through this. What do you think I should do? I'm having this kind of issue in my relationship with my mom. What do you think? You know, and she just wanted questions like that. And the whole hour panel was just that, asking her questions about life. Now, you have got to love that. You know, you have got to love that. So I already love the actress, the way she handled Kira and the way she brought it to life. But then after, you know, hearing um, Nana talk about things like that, and how she loves to encourage people and everything. That just, you know, now now I've embraced the actual actress, you know? And uh, so she she has become a wonderful, wonderful source of um, inspiration to me in reality, because, you know, I do my mom and Nana meditations and that is pull up that IG. And I'm like, oh, what's the word for the day? I was like, you know, like you read your word, you meditate, you know, and then it's like, okay, let me listen to my mom and Nana talk and see what's going on here, you know, because she's always got some great uh, inspiration and she always ends it with, you know, she's sending everyone much love and everything. So if you have not checked out her IG, please check it out. I'm telling you, there's been times I came home from work and I was stressed and I pulled up her IG and she just had the most perfect, you know, word of encouragement and, and comfort. So I love how um, the actress has done that. So when I look at this episode, um, and I look at this particular clip, it, it's, it's so interesting how it parlays into the actress and how you know she wants to help people um, resolve things going on in their world and come into a, a, a safe space of peace and tranquility. You know, in a, in a um, peace and tranquility. So that just makes you know that just makes her as an actress even more endearing to me as a person. So, okay, let's go into, I would like for our guest of honor to share with us 
how did you create your wonderful Kira costume? Oh, sure. <laughs> um, so I'm wearing one of her earlier season major uniforms. It's, okay. uh, I did buy the bodysuit new. It's a red like spandex suit. And then okay. the sleeves came off of a jacket. I just cut them off and sewed them on. The badge is made of clay. It's glued on a safety pin. You can see there. Uh, the earring is not my normal one. It's just a regular ear cuff. I did mm -hmm. make one specifically for Kira, but I couldn't find it this morning. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, but no, then... nothing complicated. Um, if I were at a con, I would wear the belt. I'm not even wearing the belt today, but okay. it's just, I bought a belt and spray painted it red. It's It doesn't have to be that complex to look good, you know? Right. So you took the shoulder modules off some other jacket? Yeah. Wow, yeah. um, that was, is great. It was all this color, but yeah. Mm -hmm. So the whole jacket was that color. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and all the Bajoran designs are really pretty easy to duplicate because all you have to do is they come in so far, you don't need to worry about messing up this seam in the sleeve. You can go wow. past it. Okay. And like quilted jackets and stuff look great for her earlier looks or corduroy. If you oh, can quilted. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, yeah. corduroy. Good, good. Okay. You see, this is what I love about it. See how simple that was? Go get yourself a yeah. quilted corduroy jacket from Goodwill or whatever, exactly. or Salvation Army. Cut off the sleeves. Get a bodysuit that's that color. That's that rust color kind of bodysuit, right? It's like rust color. Yeah, because yeah, yeah, that was her rust main rust color, color, rust. Yeah. And clip, you know, sew off the shoulders and the sleeves, and just you know, you don't have to cut anything other than that one part with the sleeve, and just sew it on. Boom, Kira costume. <laughs> just that simple. Exactly. And if, <laughs> if you don't want to do a bodysuit, you can do it with a tracksuit too. So it's two pieces. That's a lot more comfortable. Mm -hmm. Especially when going to the bathroom. That's another option. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then put the belt over mm -hmm. it. Yes. Yes, my days exactly. of one yeah. my, my days of one piece bodysuits for cosplay yeah. are totally over. They're kind <laughs> of a pain to yeah, get in and out of by yeah. yourself definitely. <laughs> It is totally two piece with the belt to make it look like it's a one piece. Yep. Okay. Because <laughs> exactly. uh, you just hide right <laughs> over the, the gap and you're good. And you're good. Because I just can't anymore, really. I mean, my my gray and black DS9 is a one piece. The first the first gray and black I made is a one yeah. piece. And then Miss Perry made my vest. But that one piece I uh, is really for photo shoots indoors. Because I don't I'm making another one, but it's yeah. two piece. It, I, I just because I just can't, you know, and I just I'm trying to figure out how to uh, have the one piece look, but it'd be two piece. But oh my god, I remember when I was uh, my first outdoor photo shoot in the one piece, and we're in the park, and you know the bathrooms are like miles away from mm -hmm. each other, so I'm like running to this bathroom. And then I'm pulling it down and it's like, it's hanging all over the place. And I'm trying to not have the sleeves touch the floor. And I'm like, the one piece yep. is not working for me anymore. It's just not working. <laughs> no, it's not the most convenient costume design in the world. But Star Trek seems to like them. Yeah, and that's not, I never understood that. Now, you, you're traveling the galaxies and you're, you're coming to all these different planets and everything. Why do people have to have on a one piece? How does people use the bathroom quickly? You have to use the bathroom you quickly and get back room. on the ship. I don't oh, understand. No. <laughs> Why are these people in a one piece? This doesn't make any sense to travel the galaxies in a one piece. You know, this is one yeah, piece going on. <laughs> Except I will give a shout out to Enterprise's uniforms, I think, are practical because they zip in the front and they have a bunch of pockets. So you can yes. take it off yourself. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Instead of trying to reach around, so yeah, who's helping you get it back That's in? <laughs> you gotta always go to the bathroom and find her. Yeah, somebody's gotta help you. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> That's wonderful. And so your makeup. Um, now you, I know I've seen you with the Bajoran nose piece. Um, yeah. Um, so this I is... usually don't wear a prosthetic. Mm -hmm. Today it's just eyeshadow. It's a little crooked, I guess. But this is because I apply makeup without glasses on, and <laughs> that's what we end up with. <laughs> but so that's away, another okay, way to give <laughs> that nose, the ridges look, is to use the eyeshadow. Um, if you don't want to use the prosthetic, you can just use eye like a darker shade to make the yeah, ridges. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So nice. are you like mm -hmm. blending it? Like how yeah, you and get you can the shading going. So I just used one shade of eyeshadow. Sometimes I'll use two and I'll do like a highlight in between. 
the darker lines to add like it looks like light is hitting and giving a shadow um i've seen people do it with eyeliner as well if you want to use a mm, pencil but i just use eyeshadow on a brush and kind of oh just blend it down until it looks like it's naturally kind of there awesome. nice nice yeah. wonderful and um miss perry you just have on a rust colored am i seeing a rust colored top that you have on um uh, looks like you have a rust colored top on to match kira's color is your kira color today kira i have i need kira color today okay yeah uh, have a good week and um, again thank you for being here and thank everybody for supporting us and continue and uh, you have a great week and we'll see you next time okay see you bye. next time thank you bye